Well, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Today we'll be talking about how to be a responsible signer. We'll be focusing on multisigs, basically because we only have seven minutes, but this applies to pretty much any uh, proposal-based governance system. So picture the situation that you have a set of smart contracts, set of assets that you want to control. You manage them via, via multisig. You are one of the signers of the multisig, and you are presented by this. What happens 99% of the time is that no one is going to review this, they are going to blindly sign it, go ahead, and pretty much defeat the purpose of the multisig. Like you only the multisig becomes a, basically a one out of n wallet where just a proposer gets whatever they want approved. The scope for today is go through a series of tools or techniques that we can do to actually verify and understand what you are signing, right? Like you understand what you sign when, whenever you sign something in real life, you should do too when dealing with, with matching internet money. And the important thing is that the tools should be understandable for non-technical people, right? In a multi-sig, it's very often that you have the CEO, COO, you have contributors to a, to a project that are not, ne not necessarily technical. So we want to make sure that they are able to review and understand what they're assigning. So we'll begin by understanding the transaction, understanding what's in a proposal. And for that, we'll go to first, there it is. So we'll start by going on, okay, what's actually in a regular Ethereum transaction, right? So we have a recipient, we have something that we call usually contract, that contract will do stuff, we'll most likely call into other contracts. We have a piece of data where we say, hey, we want you to execute this, this, and that. In this case, for instance, a swap. And we may have a value, basically something that we send to it. And the proposal in multi-sig is no different. It's basically, we are asking, our multi-sig contract to be calling to be calling another contract with some information and uh, um, optionally with some money. So the catch, the first thing that we can do is this is actually a screenshot from the Gnosis API is understand what it, what it is doing and um, like parsing that, and we can see how much money is sent. We can see which contract we're interacting with, and we can see which function is being called. Now the function may give us more or less information, right? And the first thing that we can do with this is pretty obvious. Like, go to the documentation. Every serious project has a documentation attached to it and will tell us what the function will do. That way we can actually see that, that swap exactly for tokens, what it's going to do, what each, ar each argument to it uh, is representing, actually understand what we're approving. But you guys are not here so that I tell you to read the freaking manual, so we'll look into some more interesting stuff. Something, something very, very powerful we can do is simulate the transaction. So we can use different tools, Tenderly, OpenSample in Defender, Block Native, though for now it's API, API only, to simulate what would happen if the transaction were executed now. Granted, that will not be the same as when the transaction gets actually executed. For instance, in a swap, you may get more or less tokens back later, depending on price fluctuations. But it gives you a pretty good idea, right? And the idea is that a simulation will give you different information, right? It will tell you which contracts were involved, state changes, or events. So in terms of contracts, at the very least, you can see, where, as we were saying a couple of minutes ago, one contract can call another, and another, and basically have different, different effects on the chain. And so by spotting if there is any contract that shouldn't be there, that's the first sign of alarm when we're signing something. For instance, here in the case of a swap, we see that a Uniswap pool is involved, the router, the tokens that we're exchanging, things that make sense. If we are feeling a bit more adventurous, we can also look into state changes. We can see, okay, how each of these contracts involved changed. Probably the easiest thing to go through are balances, right? Like if we are, if we are doing a swap, we would expect that the balances of one token would go up, another one would go down. And again, we can see if there are any funky things there. Usually state, however, it's difficult to parse or to understand. So the main thing that we want to look, uh, to look at are events. So any reasonably designed contract will emit an event whenever something interesting, something important happens. So there are a bunch of events that should immediately catch our attention when we're reviewing a transaction, namely a transfer, moving assets from one place to another, an approval, which is giving rights to someone else to manage our assets, anything re re um, related to role management, to ownership, and to upgrades. And events will have some extra information that we can look into to get better sense of what's happening. Now, speaking of upgrades, this pretty much deserves a whole chapter of their own. An upgrade transaction usually looks more or less like this, like calling the contract and telling it, hey, can you please upgrade to this new address? And the only information we have is literally an address. And okay, let's simulate. Now we have something new on our toolbox. 
we can see what, what it's like. Sure, the simulation will tell us, yeah, yeah, the implementation is moving to this new address, and that's all the information we have. Now, that's, that's a problem, right? Like, what, what information does an address carry? For sure, the address should have a verified source code associated to it, whether it's an ether can sourceify. But the problem is that the source code is a bit long, right? This is an actual contract from, from the graph that uh, you, Ariel, wrote. You're, you're over here. And it's like thousands of lines of code spread, ac there you are, spread across 16 different files. Like, no signer is going to review this. What a signer can review and can understand is this. It's a report that they get from an auditor, from a set of developers, from someone that say, hey, you know, we have reviewed the code at this version, and it looks good to me. And they can trust that, they, can, they rely on that, and that's what they should be using for making a decision whether they want to upgrade to another version of no or not. But the problem that we have here is bridging the gap between that identifier, that version of the source code, and what gets deployed at an address, right? So we know that there are a couple of steps involved. We have the source code that gets compiled into, um, into a binary artifact, and that in turn gets deployed to a, particular, to a particular address. So what we want to do is make this process transparent. Granted, we could ask uh, reviewers to write uh, to run a script like this and try to replicate the compilation and the deployment, but we're trying to give the tools to reviewers that are not technical to be able to do this. And let's tell the truth, like even developers are not going to do this. Like the, and there is a solution here, like it has been in traditional web development for years, it's making deployments public, reviewable, or, or auditable, traceable, like just do a deployment on CI, on, some, on anywhere that's public, that anyone can go there, can see, hey, this version of the source code has triggered this build that was deployed at this address. Make it transparent and easy to understand and to read and embed that information in the proposal that's being, that's being sent to signers so they, they can understand and they can bridge that gap from source code to an address with the code that they are approving an upgrade to. So all in all, what I'm pushing for is to make sure that multi six are actually multi, that we make use of all the people that are appointed as signers because they should have the tools to be, to be able to understand and to add security to the process by reviewing everything that's happening instead of blindly signing. And if this is not possible by a reviewer, remember the burden is on the proposer. The proposer of something needs to give you, give you as a signer all the tools that you need to be able to review and fully understand what you're signing. If that doesn't happen, you go back and you ask for as much information as you need to be able to understand what's actually happening. Thank you.